Hello, welcome to the September edition of Larimer County Snapshot News. I'm Jory Kramer, and with me today are James Sims and Adam Eggleston, and we're going to be talking about events and happenings around Larimer County. But right now, we have some breaking news for you. Adam, do you want to share about our breaking news? Yes, thank you, Jory. Um, so as of recording of uh, the podcast this uh, month, uh, which is about 5 o'clock on the uh, 16th, uh, there is a, the Pearl uh, Fire up towards the Livermore Red Feather area uh, has started the day. Um, about 2.30, it was approximately 78 acres, and currently um, they, are, they have a Livermore uh, Community Hall evacuation point. Uh, and then for more information, as this podcast comes out, reach out to uh, the Lamar County Sheriff's Office at 970-980-2500. That is the Joint Information Center that can get updates on evacuees um, up in that area. And all of Crystal Lakes is under mandatory evacuation? Yes, there's mandatory evacuations, uh, including uh, large animals, uh, up at the Crystal Lakes uh, area of Red Feather. So... Um, so we'll keep an eye on that. Thanks, Adam, for sharing that. Anytime. Adam, you've been following what's going on in Wellington. What's going on in Wellington? So Wellington's still uh, working through their water challenges um, and bills. Uh, last month, August, they started a, a, a HUG program, which is a hardship utility grant program that uh, will provide up to $300 for uh, residents having... Um, large water bills or, or struggles with paying the water bills. Um, and they have dedicated their entire discretionary fund for 2024 to that um, grant program. Uh, and so they've had uh, uh, d several people, uh, dozens of people uh, reach out and take a, a advantage of that. Um, so uh, along with the hardship grant program with the water challenges in Wellington, they have elected not to disconnect or turn off the water for those that are struggling with higher water bills. So the town board of trustees have really come together to try to find temporary um, relief for the residents as they work through the challenges of water costs. Um, with that, uh, they also, their new water treatment plant and water uh, reclamation plants, both uh, will become operational uh, first week in October. Uh, and then finally with uh, Wellington, um, they're looking at um, the regulations or around um, heavy uh, trucks um, to make sure that the roads um, stay um, usable. Not, pot not potholed. <laughs> Correct. And so they are working through that. So they've had a really interesting conversation the past uh, uh, couple meetings about making sure that they're town can handle the, the increase in um, traffic flow and uh, weights of vehicles. Well, you can sure see how that impacts all of us around Larimer County. So and uh, good to hear they're working on the folks with the difficulties paying their water bills. That's wonderful. They are. And it seems like they, um, this current board of trustees ha are really trying to find solutions and working well with the citizens to try to find solutions. Um, right now, they all agree there's not a well-defined solution, um, but they're working on several different uh, avenues. That's wonderful. That's great. James, you have a word or two for us about what's going on in Welling, in, I'm sorry, in Windsor. And you're using um, your notes, and you've also been speaking to folks up there in Windsor. So tell us what you found. Yes, good afternoon. I did talk to the Bear Pro Tim of, of Windsor, and he told me about the goings on up there the weird fight that he had on the last meeting on monday the 9th about the things that are coming that have great impact for the residents up there but first he told me i was informed about the mayor mayor klein is declared september as national suicide prevention and awareness month since Colorado is sixth nas nationally in suicides. Wow. Yes, and it has, and that number has never gone down. And I'm glad that they are they're working towards this. Also, also during this time, she told me they, he told me about how Summit Stone, 
Summit Stone's layoffs of 75 workers will not impact the behavioral the behavioral study of behavior center that was opened in December. It's a simple transfer from patients from Summit Stone over to the behavioral center. I also I also talked about they also talked about a very strange happenings on the Poudre River Trail Authority where a bear was found on the trail. Wow. Yes. The police came and subdued and, and quartered off the area and waited until the proper authorities were were seen. But the big news of the the big news of Windsor was the fact of a seventy five what telecommunications tower was approved with the tower being near the Jacoby Farms subdivision. It was originally in 2023 to be 107, 102 feet, and it was brought down, down to 75. While it did cause a lot of concern and a long night for the representatives, they did follow all procedures of the Windsor laws and bylaws and the federal regulations set forth by the Federal Communications Commission. The city planner, Sandra, recommended that, recommended that they uh, approve this measure, and they approved it for the Jacoby Farm subdivision, a new subdivision in the eastern portion of Windsor. I love the fact that the community was involved and it made the representatives really work for their meeting today. They had oh, they had many community members discuss the tower's impact on property value, personal fi personal finance, environment, wildlife, health risks, aesthetics, and the proximity to the new neighborhoods. They're also worried about the children, the elementary schools, and the community outdoor recreational trails. I'm glad that they did compromise from a 102-foot tower down to a 75. It does show that community involvement does, in fact, help. Mr. Brandon, Mr. Brandon Dittman was ret retained by the town to discuss how wireless facilities are unique compared to other land use restrictions. Education is the way to go. <laughs> Education and civic engagement, the cornerstones of democracy. Yes, I okay. couldn't say that better or agree more. All right, all right. Well, guys, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, giving you a little bit of an update on the donations to the um, Alexander Mountain Fire victims that we had a couple of months ago. We've all heard of the arrest of a man suspected of starting the Alexander Mountain Fire, which has, a for which has fortunately been extinguished. However, the Larimer County Assessor's Office completed a property damage report from the Alexander Mountain Fire on August 4th. The fire burned more than 9,600 acres, the assessor's report found 52 homes were damaged or lost. That figure includes 27 destroyed homes, 21 outbuildings, and four damaged homes. So yay for our heroic wildfire fighters. What a terrific job they did. They really did. It was, we got lucky with some weather up in yes, that area. very lucky. Rain. The, <laughs> the team and the um, um Firefighters were just absolutely relentless in making sure that they, they protected as much as they could. There's a lot of houses up there. So, but then, Adam, you were telling me last month that, that you folks at the sheriff's office, Adam works as a victim's advocate at the sheriff's office, and you were telling me last month that you received so many donations at the sheriff's office, you finally put the word out to please stop bringing them. But it, that, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to make a, it's it's very in, uh, heartening to see so much support within our community um, come out to support uh, our neighbors. And so when it was very, happen. very nice to yeah. see um, how much uh, caring we have in our communities. Well, and I um, know that, that, you know, so many of us have made donations. And I got to wondering how the victims are um, faring and how, if they're, if they are receiving those donations. So those turned out to be very good questions that I could not get answers to. 
One place that did set up a donation fund for the victims was the Northern Colorado Community Foundation, and they are still collecting donations for the victims. The foundation recently sent out a newsletter in which they said they received an additional $14,000 from Kyle Clark's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign that he holds weekly on his show next. Um, the NOCO Foundation does not fund individuals directly, but instead it sends those funds to two organizations. One is called Serve 68 and the other is 211. Serve 68 is a disaster response organization sponsored by several area churches, including Resurrection Fellowship in Loveland and Timberline Church in Fort Collins, and many other others across northern Colorado. And 211 is uh, 211 Colorado is a statewide information service for people in crisis. NOCO Foundation's newsletter did not say how much money has been donated, nor how much money has been dispersed so far. It did say it anticipates it will continue receiving requests and making distributions through 2025. GoFundMe has also set up a hub for donations for wildfire victims in Colorado. They donated the first 74000 and so far have raised 122860 of their goal of 150000 People can apply to receive help, and the website says they will usually get their grant in a day or two. But again, no report on how much has been dispensed so far. Another GoFundMe was set up for two horses injured when they were being transported from Sylvandale to the evacuation center. That GoFundMe received $41,294 out of the $50,000 requested. A September 13th update from organizer Joshua Chiardulo on the GoFundMe website noted that one of the horses developed an infection that was resistant to antibiotics and his wound was not healing as hoped. He needed to be placed in a full cast to let the wound heal, but with the infection needing to be cleaned daily, that was not an option, and unfortunately, he had to be put down. The other horse, according to Chiardulu, has a long trail to ride, quote-unquote, but is doing well and should be moved to a rehabilitation center sometime this week. I reached out to GoFundMe, Northern Colorado Community Foundation and Serve 68 to um, get answers to the questions about how much has been received and how much they've dispersed, but I have not heard back of this as of this recording, so I will continue to seek those answers and bring them to you in our next episode. Serve, Serve 6.8 does uh, amazing work, and we work closer with them because uh, they can provide a lot of um, the uh, stopgap ne needs of victims and just individuals within our community. Well, I know they were raising that. a lot of, um, they were raising donations of in-kind in donations, like uh, soap and toothpaste, that kind of thing. So, very much so. Yeah, very good. So, well, the next thing on my mind is ballots and that type of thing. So, Adam, wh when's the election? Uh, what election? What election? Is there an election? There's a little election coming up, I think. There's a small election coming up. Uh, and so for uh, Lemmer County, uh, the ballots will start being mailed um, as of October 11th. That's a Friday coming up, folks. That's a Friday. It's uh, about two weeks away. Um, and then starting October 21st, uh, voting services and polling centers will begin to open in waves. Uh, with the last date to mail your ballot on the 28th of October. So uh, we're about five weeks away from the last day to mail your ballot, six weeks away from the election. Um, so it's kind of a, a lot of activity coming up, son. And... Oh, go ahead. I have a question for you. What if you want to be in, get involved in um, voting and helping with the uh, voting elections? How would they How would they do that? Yes, I know that. You go to the Larimer County Clerk website and you can apply there to be a poll judge. And it costs no money. And how much education do you need or training do you need? That I don't know, and it probably depends on what they have you doing. But these are paid positions. They are not. 
they're not huge, hu- hugely. You won't get rich, but there is a little stipend. You do to get compensated for your time, and, yes. and I don't believe there's any requirement for like college education or basic. basic no, knowledge. oh no, no. It's just um, to be a. Um, there is some training though, like for validating signatures. If, but those are kind of. Uh, I mean, how deep are you going to go? So yeah. it's that's all on the website. Well, that's good to know. And that little bit of money helps with Christmas presents. Just something to keep in mind. Absolutely. So um, the League of Women Voters also is trying to help educate voters. And so they have invited all the candidates that are appearing for the state offices and the county offices to candidate forums that will be held um starting September 30th, when the candidates for the offices of Larimer County Commissioner, Clerk and Recorder, and District Attorney will meet in the Fort Collins City Council Chambers for the forum. Forum starts at 7 p.m., and again, this is on the 30th, Monday the 30th. It will be broadcast live on Comcast Channel 14 and Connection Channel 14, and also streamed on the fcgov.com website. Being a candidate previously and being able to participate um, as a candidate in these uh, forums, it's absolutely fun and uh, informative. And it's not um, like you see at the national news, you actually get good information and it's, it's fun camaraderie. It is. And it's not really a debate because the candidates are posed the same question and they answer it. So it's their position. They're not giving a rebuttal to something else or an argument. So it's a little different than a debate. It's just a forum to hear where they stand. And what's exciting about them is is that the in-person audience has a chance to submit questions for the candidates. So I will be there. I'll be a timer. So, so it's fun. It's, <laughs> it's engaging. Fun. I definitely recommend yeah. everyone to uh, come in person if they can or view um, on one of the channels. Definitely. Or well, and then there'll be a forum for the state house districts um, in Fort Collins, 52, 53, 65, and state senate district 14. And that will be happening on Wednesday, October 2nd at 7 p.m., again in the Fort Collins City Council Chambers, again broadcast on Channel 14 on Comcast and Connection, and uh, uh, live streamed on the fcgov.com website. And then on Thursday, October 3rd, the candidates for the Loveland area, the State House Districts 49, 51, 64, and District 23, will appear at 7 p.m. in the Loveland City Council Chambers. And it will be broadcast on Comcast and Pulse Channels 16 and 880, and also live-streamed at lovegov.org slash tv. So, again, these are not debates. Uh, each The candidates will each give an introductory remarks, and then they will answer questions. And then the candidates, after they, are, uh, after they finish answering the questions, there'll be a time for them to give concluding remarks and then have a meet and greet with the audience afterwards. That's so always fun. That is. So, um, you can find out which district you live in by visiting vote411.org. And and if you can't make it to uh, watch the live stream or to to the forums in person, the recordings will be posted to the Larimer County uh, League website, and that's lwv-larimercounty.org. So also, um, we have issue forums. And those presentations will be on Monday, October 7th at Foothills U- Unitarian at 6.30, Wednesday, October 9th from 1 to 3 at the Old Town Library, and Wednesday, October 7th uh, via Zoom. And you have to register on the Pooter Library website for that one. On Thursday, October 17th at the Harmony Library, 1 to 3 p.m., and Friday, October 18th, 7 to 8.30 at the Namaqua Unitarian Church in Loveland. And again, those are um, issues that are going to appear on this week's ballot. And so it's a good way to get some information about the issues. And Adam, there's some other ways to get information about the issues and candidates. Yeah, thank you. One of my favorite ways is the Blue Book um, that has um, all the um, ballots in a 
um, digestible fashion um, with minor pros and cons. Um, so very, very neutral, just information. Uh, and the blue book's important because I think this year, looking at the different palettes based on where you live, there could be between 15 and 20 different items on this it's year's palette. It's a beast. And so getting, um, reading, going through the blue book beforehand would give um, you a kind of a... Uh, a basic idea of what you're looking at voting for, what um, voters are looking at. And so I think it would be very, very useful. Where, ex where exactly can you pick up the blue books? It's a good question. I'm not sure. They will be they mailing them. They always just them. mail them. Yeah, That's they do a, mail them. Yeah. Um, and then I'm, I would guess, and this is a guess, you probably will be able to pick them up at the county um, buildings uh, and city hall as well. Yeah. So you will be informed, no matter, there's no excuse, you will be informed of what's going on. Well, and you can be even more informed by going to vote411.org, where the candidates upload information themselves about themselves and their positions. So between the blue book and vote411.org and my mail-in ballot, I just sit there with everything open in front of me and, and really think about it and take my time. It, you know, Colorado is really fantastic, and Lamar County is about allowing you having the time to digest the ballot in initiatives um, and vote with knowledge. Uh, and so I think that's why we have a very well-educated ele uh, uh, electorate throughout we the really uh, uh, state. Well, guys, I have just a couple more things. Can I share them real quick with y'all? Please do. Yes, please do. Um, I just want to congratulate my neighbor in back of us, the Harmony Village Mobile Home Park, for becoming a next-level neighborhood. This is a designation given to neighborhoods around Fort Collins by the city who complete a number of positive community building events. The activities to qualify fall into one or more of the three categories, environmental sustainability, social sustainability, and community capital activities. So neighborhoods are encouraged to plan and complete activities that support their goals and fit the neighborhood's unique culture and might include book clubs, community gardens, and educational presentations. So I found this out when I was on a walk the other day and saw the sign on the entrance to the neighborhood that they were now a next-level neighborhood. That's fantastic news. Yeah. So I've been playing in and riding my bike in through uh, a trailer park for Mobile Home Park uh, since I was seven or eight so yeah it's fantastic to see yeah it really is and other next level neighborhoods are alta vista hampshire square maple hill oak ridge observatory village warren lake and parkwood east now you guys got to keep your eyes open because around town the murphy center and homeward alliance have hidden 984 little purple houses interesting and these are um part of their homeless awareness campaign. They chose that number because there are currently 984 adults and children known to the Murphy Center and Homeward Alliance by name. And so these are people that are in a pool of people seeking housing resources. So the houses are hiding in plain sight. So if you find a house recorded on the interactive map on the Homeward Alliance website, and then put it on your desk as a reminder to get involved and maybe help solve this. It's a great way to get community engagement and it, build awareness. I, I, I want to get that. out and start looking for them. Um, there are also among the 984 purple houses, there are 12 white houses that have been hidden amongst them. And each of those white houses represents one of the 12 unhoused people who passed away in northern Colorado while waiting for a housing resource in 2023. On average, 20 people across the United States die each day while living on the streets. They die from treatable conditions and at the average age of their mid-40s. So it's a good thing to keep in mind. And then one last thing. Do you guys like to go leaf peeping? I used to love looking at the aspens and the turning of the leaves. It was a great and relaxing thing. And you can scrapbook all the leaves. Yes, I used to love doing that. 
I I, uh, I enjoy taking nice long drives in the mountains and enjoying the, the fall colors. Yeah. Oh, and James, you mentioning scrapbooking. I used to do that so much as a kid. I had more dried leaves, yes. <laughs> but um, the Colorado State Patrol recently sent out a press release where they asked people to bear in mind that um, leaf peeping, you need to pay attention to the road as well as to the leaves. Um, looking at 2023 crash data for Western Colorado for September and October, just a two-month period in 2023, which leaf peeping season, the Colorado State Troopers investigated 21 fatal crashes in the high country. 21. The vast majority stemmed from two causes, lane violations and careless driving. The CSP urges drivers to exercise caution when sightseeing. Sight Stay focused on the road, be patient, and leave space between you and the vehicles ahead. And of course, use a designated driver if you've been imbibing or smoking marijuana. So, uh, the, uh, And also remember, at this time of year, there's a lot of uh, movement of wildlife. Um, and so be take extra cautious when driving through yes. our mountain areas because there could be wildlife crossing the road. And when you come upon that wildlife, don't just stop in the middle of the road. Try to find a place where you can safely pull over. Do not get out of your car and approach the wildlife. But if you have to stop, do so safely. Don't try not to block traffic. True. True. And also keep in mind that you're visiting their land, not the other way around. So let them enjoy their lives. Don't approach or or startle or even worry these animals. They're just living their lives. Indeed they are. Okay, well, we're going to take a few minutes to just talk about something, give our opinions that has been on our minds recently, the last few weeks. And this is the changes to basically the Colorado Sunshine Laws and the effects that it has recently had on the Colorado legislature. So, Adam, could you give us a little background? Uh, yes. At the last normal session uh, for 2024 at the state, uh, they passed a Senate Bill 24157 uh, that makes it... Um, Previously, if um, legislators would have um, public um, conversations or what they consider public about policy, um, procedures, um, meetings, uh, they would have to disclose that it was a public meeting if three or more um, individuals at the state elect officials were, were communicating about a particular subject. Uh, what Senate Bill 24157 did was eliminate that requirement to notify and update um, the public on public meetings that are electronically com communicated, uh, effectively making it so they can communicate freely without any engagement or input from the public electronically um, when it comes to policy that may impact all of us. And indeed, it did impact all of us recently. There was a special session called, and they only had the legislature... Colorado State Legislature only had three days to get business done, and magically, voila, legislation was produced and passed. So this is a prime example of how they were able to communicate uh, the co a lot, uh, communicate without having the sunshine of um, opposition inputs or even um, individuals that agree that may have input from the public. And then they came up with a... Um, a compromise that no one knew was a compromise were coming uh, until it was already essentially in the books and and ready to be voted on. So it really um, reduced the ability for the general public to be aware and engage in the policy um, when it comes to property tax changes. That that is interesting. I'm going to date myself because I remember going to meetings and as a young man in the 70s and the early 80s talking about this very thing. I know that the that government needs to do some certain things in private. However, that since they are government employees, that makes them public people, which means 
And with the 21st century, everything is everything is on your email and on your phones and everything can and should be recorded. Those times have changed from the 70s and 80s. Is there a way that the Sunshine Law could integrate some of these new technologies to prevent this from happening? What can we do as citizens, as a public, to stop this? Because I'm getting tired of fighting these battles that I fought 30, 40, 50 years ago. That's a good question. I don't know if there's a definitive answer besides, um, you know, vocalizing your thoughts and your opposition to these bills and this these policies to our elected officials. Unfortunately, um, the technology has changed, but the mindset or it seems like the philosophy to do things kind of out of the viewing eyes of the public and engagement of the citizens that elect them uh, isn't new. And so I don't know what mechanisms can be used, and this is just my opinion, what mechanism besides engaging and voting the current elected officials out who voted f to support this. Um, and that's that's hard because they this if you're not a mono um, policy kind of person where it's just one policy is why you decide your votes, um, it, it's challenging. And so whenever you get um, elected officials that feel they are emboldened to uh, make these calls, and they were at the state where they had very little opposition when they were um, uh, reading through it, uh, it, it seems like it passed very easily in the House session and the state Senate session. It was signed by the governor. Um, and it seems like their argument would be technology has changed, so we don't meet face-to-face -face anymore. We do it via um, electronic means. And this bill makes it so they can essentially meet secretly through electronic means. Yeah. And, um, I thought it was interesting that last spring when they were passing the bill, there were no people, no general citizens speaking in favor of the bill. Everyone who spoke was opposed to it. And that include the Colorado Freedom of Information Coalition um, and many other organizations that work towards keeping our press free and valuable. Um, to, uh, because the reason, um, I, I just am appalled that this is happening because it just seems to me that freedom of the press is such a pillar of democracy. And that involves this transparency in government and not having these back rooms, cigar smoke filled rooms where people are making decisions without public input. And yes, I realize it's much more efficient, much more quicker, much more easier. And maybe we all agree with the outcome and maybe that's why they're justifying it. They think that this, the outcome justified the means, but we really have to be careful. And as James says, quit fighting these battles that we fought 20, 30, 40 years ago. It, and I think it's important to note that I, I think the reason it passed, and we're seeing this not just in Colorado, but throughout the nation and different levels of government, is when we don't have opposition parties that are functioning and having that open discussion instead of having just mono uh, or singular parties run um, different um, parts of the government so powerfully that they are emboldened that to make those decisions and these policies regardless of what the citizens are asking for. I, I agree with that too. I agree with everything you said, but I have to add one more thing that the politicians that we are electing are monolithic policies. They only believe in one thing. And if we're, if you're not talking about what they want to talk about, then they'll abstain or just vote party line. I think we need to elect and people need to run on multiple platforms so that they can understand the broader, the broader implications of what government does. Government is not just one thing. There are several things. And as, as we get older and as technology has changed, one one singular issue is not enough. We need we need to have a pluralistic opinions. You can two things can be true at the same time. You can have this opinion and st still believe in your primary party. 
it is very strange that this bill brought a lot of people out into what I call the beer house table where everybody is screaming and yelling because, but they're all saying the same thing. And the people, especially the especially people with mono issues, ignore the beer house arguments and they need to listen to them, which is more important than just town halls, but actually beer house and listen to them. This is how this country was created in beer houses all over the 13 colonies. And they listen to them. Are you saying beer houses or bigger houses? <laughs> no, it was, yeah, it's a old Philadelphia term and it's called a beer house policies where you, where basically you come in, you not, it's very informal and you just air out your grievances and the politician says, okay, I will do everything I can about your policy and your policy and your policy. And I will look into it. That all the policies are not ignored or given lip service, but are actually worked on. This is what this country and democracy and the federalized republic is based upon, in my opinion. So in Colorado, we shouldn't have any reason not to um, engage in social discourse over a beer with as many breweries and delicious offerings we have in Colorado. That's our opinion. <laughs> that is our opinion. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think it's a good one. And and again, just that the, there has to be public input and the chance for that. And that's how democracy works. That's how the sausage gets made. Yeah. It's sometimes watching the sauces, engaging in how policies are made. Sometimes it's not entertaining, and sometimes it's right. nuanced and it's challenging. Yes. But it's rewarding at the end when you can find compromises and have open discourse and discussion. So I hope we can find a way to have our elected officials come back to the proverbial brewery beer house uh, and really start engaging and trying to find solutions for all of us in a compromising and uh, nuanced fashion. I think that's a good point to end on. To, and these, again, were our opinions, and they do not necessarily represent the opinions of FC Public Media nor the city of Fort Collins. So just us three. Well, that's all we have for this edition, and we're talking amongst ourselves that maybe we will go to every two weeks. And I really want to thank the folks that have been uh, letting us know that you're, you're listening. We appreciate that. And we also thank the Colorado Citizen Observer Corps for their fine work in keeping an eye on our local governments. You can read their reports free of charge at coloradocitizenobservers.substack.com. If you're interested in becoming a volunteer observer, visit their website for more details citizenobserversco.co And we would love to hear from you. Um, if you have news tips uh, for us or want to share your opinions or have a connection for us, uh, please email us at lc.snapshotnews That's uh, lc.snap s-h-o-t-n-e-w-s at gmail.com Thanks for joining us today. And if you like this show, please send the link to your friends and family. I'm James Sims. I'm Adam Eggleston. And I'm Jory Kramer. Bye for now.